Shalom, shalom. Welcome to Elevation Talk. <laughs> I'm your host, Prophetess Ndipia Marlin. Listen, I'll be talking you into your next level. I hope you're prepared. So today we're discussing, is Africa poor by design? Is the poverty in our continent by design? Is somebody behind it? And if so, who are these people? Today we're going to be listening. I'm going to be adding, you know, some footage by Professor Howard Nicholas, uh, who's an economics teacher at the International Institute of Social Studies, Arsamas University in the Netherlands. And he has been an advisor to the Ministry of Policy Planning of Sri Lanka. And uh, basically, he loves to talk about the Marxist theories and um, economics in general. He talks about Africa being poor by design. And I want you to take a listen to this. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share with somebody. When you like my videos, it gives visibility to them. YouTube gives visibility to them, and we, we defeat the algorithm. So I'd really appreciate it if you liked, comment, and you shared. Thank you so much for tuning in, and don't forget to watch my other videos. Take a look at the clip. Leave your comments below on what you think concerning what he says. Thank you for tuning in. That you already know. Okay, so what this presentation is fundamentally designed to say is this. Africa historically, Sub-Saharan Africa, has been fundamental to the global prosperity of the advanced countries. Okay? And Africa had a role to play. It has a role as a raw material producer. We will not allow Sub-Saharan Africa to escape that. Okay, we do everything to keep Sub-Saharan Africa where it is, also impoverished. It's absolutely vital for the prosperity of everyone else. So let's get clear about that. Okay, and this means all the economic structures, all the global institutions, and the economics we teach everyone is all designed to keep Africa exactly where it is. And whether it is Europe or US or now China, it's always the same. We need Africa to be impoverished because we need those raw materials and we need them dirt cheap. Okay, so that's the message. It doesn't mean to say that there's nothing Africans can do. Of course there is. Okay, but this is the opposition that they're fighting. This is what it's about. Because if Africa does do something different, I assure you living standards of all those in Europe and North America and Asia is going to fall. Okay? And that is a big price to pay. I assure you that the West is not going to allow that without a big fight. Okay? So this is what it's fundamentally about. Uh, what I want to show you is how these structures are operating. It's just 20 minutes, so we can't do very much, but just to give you a little bit of an idea. And why I keep the ideology part there is because we are part of the producers of ideology. At universities and academic institutions, we are complicit in this whole enterprise. Okay, so the job of many Western academics is to convince Africans they have to keep doing what they're doing. Okay? And to show them, it's your fault that you're poor. It's not our fault. It's your fault that you're poor. You know? So this is what we do in academic institutions. And I, I want to show that as well. Let me just start. This is what it's basically about. So you, you know what it's about. But I want to just show you the extent to which Africa is specializing in the production of raw materials and basic agricultural goods. Um, we know the basic forces that have caused this underdevelopment. We know it's colonization. I will not discuss that very much because my colleague speaker is going to go into some aspects of this. But I do want to discuss the global economic <coughs> structures, the global financial institutions, and economic ideology, briefly, to give you a flavor of those. Let me start with this. You can't really see it so easily, but if those of you who are interested, you want 
the PowerPoint, I'm sure we can make it available to you. Uh, but the thing that you really need to see is the top line. Okay, and the extent of dependency is captured by this statistic at the top. Okay, and you compare it with all other income groups, and what you see is essentially in that one statistic how dependent Sub-Saharan Africa is on raw material production. Okay, this is the very heart of what makes Sub-Saharan Africa beat. Okay, here, just to have a look at one very important additional statistic with all this export coming from Sub-Saharan Africa, how much does Sub-Saharan Africa account for in terms of global trade value? value. <coughs> we know there are vast resources coming from there, but look at the bottom line in terms of global trade value. Look at that. 0.5% Seventy-five point nine five percent going down to point one to point one, meaning that with all these vast resources being produced, how much are they getting for it? Nothing. Nothing. This is a very significant piece of data. Then I just want to show you what has happened. To Sub-Saharan Africa, because what we know, what we know, and from all studies, no country ever develops without manufacturing. Okay, producing raw materials will not take you anywhere. Producing basic agricultural goods will not take you anywhere. And let's have a look at how much manufacturing activity takes place in Sub-Saharan Africa. We can look over the last 15 odd years, 15, 20 years, and we see manufacturing has actually declined as a percentage of the total. This is percentages of total production in Sub-Saharan Africa, how much of it is accounted for by manufacturing. So this figure here is 17% of the total. Most of the rest when we talk of industry, it includes manufacturing, but the bulk of it is mining, okay? Raw material extraction, this is the bulk of it. And here we, th we see actually raw material extraction has stayed the same. What has caused industry to fall is the fall in manufacturing production. This is deliberate because we will never, as Western economists, as Western policymakers, we cannot afford to allow Africa to industrialize and start producing manufacturers. Okay, so we will do everything to stop that. And I'm going to show you how we actually block that. It's obvious in certain ways, but it's less obvious in other ways. Now, we have actually seen periods of rapid growth in Sub-Saharan Africa, misleading people, saying, oh, you know, we're now doing much better. And this has happened recently. Recently, I've had students come and tell me, we've done much better now. And you can see growth rates rose quite sharply in recent times. Now are starting to go again down. But if you look historically, the same thing happened earlier. Why? Because in these two periods, we had East Asian rapid industrialization processes. So in the earlier period, we had Japan and Korea and Taiwan. Okay, rapid growth, sucking in raw materials from Africa, driving up the prices, and then Sub-Saharan African countries grew. Exporting raw materials, they grew. But after those countries finished industrialization, then Sub-Saharan African growth rate again fell. 
Okay, but along comes China. Next wave. Okay, again, Sub-Saharan African growth rises, but now China is going down. As many of you now know from the press, China is going down. But Sub-Saharan Africa is going down even faster. And we're going to go back to where we were again with very low prices of raw materials, very low growth rates, and again, the sorts of poverty that we saw once before. Because, bottom line, Sub-Saharan Africa is condemned to this role, just the supplier of raw materials, not a manufacturer. Very recent data showing <laughs> emerging markets that produce raw materials against emerging markets that produce manufacturers. And you can see now with the weakness in the global economy, it's the emerging markets, that's the red line, it's those countries that are suffering the most, the emerging markets producing raw materials. They're suffering the most. And here, it translates into their currencies being butchered. Okay? The currencies are collapsing of these countries, and many of them are sub-Saharan African countries. Some of them are Latin American countries, okay, who also rode that same wave. They thought that raw material production was going to save them. But now they're facing terrible problems. And I'm sorry to say, it's just going to get worse in the next two years. It's not going to get any better. And this is, was it, this is what it does in terms of gross domestic product. It's the blue line you should look at. It's the blue line compared with the red line. And what we know is that blue line is really going to go down sharply in the next two years. Okay, so relative to the rest of the world, Sub-Saharan Africa is going to suffer. Again, why? Because it's condemned to this raw material production. This is basically why. How is it condemned to that? Well, the first, the first and most important is the economic structures. After colonization ended, we needed new structures to keep these countries where they were. Okay? And the first of those is aid. Okay? We give them aid. Aid for what? Actually, we give them aid to keep repressive regimes in power. That's all. Okay? We're not giving them aid for much more except a little bit of infrastructure to make sure those raw materials get to the ports and aren't gotten out of the ground. <coughs> but for the most part, we give repressive regimes money and power and guns to keep that system going. This is what it's fundamentally about. All the hypocrisy about transparency and democracy and bullshit like that, it's all bullshit. <laughs> you know? And at least the Chinese don't enter into that bullshit. They say, we don't care about the whole political environment, we just give the money. Okay? And it's for raw material extraction, period. Okay? Number two, and this was a very important one, still is debt. I was telling some of my students today, was it today or yesterday, about confessions of an economic hitman. You remember this? Have, have any of you heard of this one? Confessions of an Economic Hitman. It's a book written by John Perkins, who used to work for a very nebulous, opaque bank. No one had ever heard of this bank. But it was formed in the 1950s by the IMF, the CIA, and the American State Department. And it had only one job to lend money to developing countries that were raw material producers in order to indebt them. Once you are in my debt, I control you. Okay? And this bank 
had 4,000 employees. But no one ever heard of this bank, you see. But it would go to country after country offering loans. And if the president did not accept the loan, they were killed. And he gives two examples of presidents who were killed when they did not accept the loan. You see, the lending is also very important to trap the country. It's very important. It's part of that process. I teach in Suriname. And Suriname in recent times had a huge foreign exchange reserve. So big they didn't need to borrow money. And then one of my students who was very high up in government, he said, you know, the IMF is trying to convince us to borrow money from foreigners. Why? I thought, duh, you know, sorry about this, but, you know, this is the game. And in the end, Suriname did borrow this money because the IMF said, if foreigners lend to you, then everyone will think Suriname is such a strong economy that foreigners are interested in lending to you. You understand? Before Lula came to power, you know, the previous president in Brazil, Cardoso, his predecessor, took a gigantic international loan. No necessity for taking the loan. Why? Because once I catch you with the debt strings, I hold you forever. You are my prisoner. Okay, so debt has been this huge spider's web which has trapped sub-Saharan Africa and keeps them held there. Aid, debt. We have a third structure which is again not known by many people, but it's something that was put in place and continues to this very day. With no one discussing it, no one says anything about it, it is monopoly buying structures. This is for all raw materials and basic agricultural goods produced by developing countries there are only four or five Western multinationals that buy all those goods. And they collude between them. So if you take any major product, these Western multinationals, they collude between them. Even if we go down to banana production, we had a PhD done here at the ISS, and the person showed that the four or five major multinationals, they collude, and in order to make sure their control is total, what they do is they force all the producers to pr produce the same uniform banana. You know, the crap you buy in the West and has no taste at all? You go to any developing country, you know how a banana tastes, don't you? There's so many of them, lots of varieties. But we only market one or two types, so we have control, you see. If you don't produce at the price I want you to produce, I go to the next country. You see, we get control. So these buyers, they impose that control, and they keep pushing the prices down and down and down. Okay, this is the game. No one says anything about it. There are no commissions of inquiry to say, this is illegal what you're doing. The WTO has nothing to say about this. But sorry to say, you know, if banana prices rose ten times, especially for people like me who love bananas, okay, I protest. I like my living standards. Okay, it's the same with all the other raw materials, you see. We're all benefiting, we're complicit. We're actually complicit in this because we will protest and shout out if the situation ever changed. <coughs> okay, now we come to those international institutions. And I must tell you this from the outset. Don't think of them as wicked. IMF, World Bank, WTO. We always think evil creatures. Horrible. It's not. It's just economics. It's economic warfare. The rich declare war on the poor. It happens everywhere. It happens in a country. The rich control the government. Of course they do. You really believe you have democracy? Come on. You know, I mean, grow up. This is not about 
people living in democratic systems. What we have is the rich control. The rich set up these institutions explicitly to control the poor countries. And they don't give them much room for maneuver. Which incidentally, when the IMF starts talking of poverty alleviation, you should also understand that there's another game there also starting to play, which I'm going to come back to later. But what do these institutions do? What does the IMF do? What is structural adjustment about? It's about making sure countries keep producing what we want them to produce. We make sure they have recurrent balance of payments problems. You notice these countries never get out of balance of payments problems. You notice that? Whereas countries that never took IMF support are always out of balance of payments problems. But the countries that are continuously getting advice and support by the IMF, they're always in balance of payments problems. Why? Because that's the way we keep our stranglehold on them. And that's what we have done. We have done, the IMF and the World Bank. And they've also done something very, very important. And that is they have destroyed the self-sufficiency of these countries. Colonization started it. Okay? One of the most important things is we destroy food self-sufficiency. Okay? And the World Bank continued it. They forced most countries to eliminate all food subsidies and food support. Okay? Because once you don't produce your own food, I increase my control of you. <coughs> How do we know this? Well, very funny thing happened some years ago. Not so funny, actually. It involved starvation of a large number of people in Malawi. Okay? Many of you could remember this because it was really tragic. But the Malawian finance minister, who was under terrible threat at the time, suddenly broke ranks and he said, well, do you know why we have this famine? Because one of the conditions of the loan given by the World Bank was we destroyed all our grain surplus stocks. Why? Because remember, we want you dependent. 1970s, the US Senate the U.S. Congress said, we will not allow Latin America to produce their own food. We will start a strategy involving the IMF and the World Bank to destroy food self-sufficiency of Latin America. Then they will indeed be our true backyard. And that's exactly what they've done. Look at all the Latin American countries. Look at them. They used to be food self-sufficient, but they're no longer food self-sufficient. Now here comes the kicker. This is the beautiful part of it. I'm, I congratulate them. You know I admire them because they do it so well. Okay? I, I know it sounds really perverse, but we have now in the WTO something called the Agreement on Agriculture. Okay? You know what that Agreement on Agriculture states? It says, if you don't have any subsidies, you're not allowed to put these subsidies on food. But if you have subsidies and income support for food production, you can keep them. Who has all the subsidies and income support? US, Europe. The largest budgets in the world for supporting their farmers are Europe and US. But the World Bank and IMF have destroyed all those subsidies. You see, all those subsidies have been destroyed. And now we're telling these countries, you don't have subsidies, tough luck, you know. You see, we're keeping them dependent. We're keeping them on a string. I have five minutes, so I have to be choosy about what I say next. We have lots of examples in the WTO to really stop Africa industrializing. This is the crucial thing. We cannot allow them to produce manufacturers. It's not difficult. Trust me, it's not difficult. We need nationalist governments. We need them committed to industrialization, and it won't take them a decade to move out from where they are. 
This is the fundamental point. It's not difficult. But this next round of the WTO is designed to block that. If we had time, I would go through all the different things that they're trying to put into place to block anyone else getting on top of the ladder. You've read this book of Ha Jun Chang, Kicking Away the Ladder. You see, when we become rich, we make sure the others can't climb up the ladder and join us. Okay, and this is what this next Doha round is about. It's to make sure, especially sub-Saharan African countries, do not escape. Since I have about three minutes left, I'm going to go to this economic ideology thing, because this is important for academics. You see, we teach, in many cases, garbage. And it doesn't hurt anyone, a lot of this garbage. You know, it's a blah, 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 blah. And we don't know what we have learned, but anyway, we were there at the university, and you got a certificate, and you go away, and you feel you've learned something. <laughs> But sometimes we teach very destructive things. And no more important than when we're teaching people from developing countries. Okay? And one of those very damaging and destructive things is the doctrine of comparative advantage. It's a lie from beginning to end. It's utter crap. It has been decimated many times, but we keep it in every curriculum. Why? because it tells sub-Saharan African countries that their destiny is to produce raw materials, you see. And if you produce raw materials, you get rich just like we are in the West. You see, this is the game we're playing. And just for you to be totally confused, we normally build models with it, mathematical models. So you really have no idea what we're talking about. But it seems all very scientific. Then we have the modern version of this is because it's all a failure, we know it's a failure, we now have a new generation of economists saying, ah, it's only a failure because you're all corrupt in your countries. We call that new institutional economics. You've all probably learnt it all, but you didn't know why they invented it. It was invented to tell you the same thing, you should keep producing raw materials, now don't be as corrupt as you were before. Nobody ever told you that aid was designed to actually start the corruption process in the first place. Okay, and we need corruption to make sure you're doing all these things. But now we blame the victim. You're poor because it's your fault, basically. And you're poor, stupid and corrupt. Basically, this is the message that we're giving people. We also have many theoretical justifications, but I'm going to say something controversial to end. And she's happy that I'm ending because she has to discipline me. And that is, there are also what I call more enlightened approaches, but which are also potentially destructive for sub-Saharan African <coughs> development. And this is where I come back to the IMF and the World Bank. You see, now they're all into poverty alleviation. They want you to concentrate on redistributing income. And it's something nice. You're young people, you're socially conscious, you're aware. You don't like all this injustice. So you gravitate towards what we call pro-poor strategies. But actually, I'm sorry to tell you, that is not what Africa needs. Africa needs aggressive industrialization. When China was a communist country and we had equal distribution, who feared China? Who took them seriously? They weren't even the size of the Netherlands. But today, I can't open an internet site. I can't open a magazine. I can't open a newspaper without China, 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 China. And we know. What has built China? It's not socialism or communism, it's capitalism, guys. It's manufacturing, it's production. This is what creates employment, this is what created jobs. I'm not pro-capitalist, but this is the reality. And unfortunately, we're now going to court, get caught with the good cop, bad cop. 
The good cop is now IMF saying, oh, you must concentrate on poverty reduction and income redistribution as long as we can take you away from industrialization. This is the crucial thing, you know. I leave it at that. And I'm sorry I took so much.